Um, so welcome all. Uh, lovely to see you. And welcome especially to uh, Richard Sorosi Hector Sensi, um, who it's been my delight to spend some time on the map with and, and otherwise. Um, I always think of Two Rock Dojo as my spiritual home in America. Um, mm. I, I just found it a lovely place to come to, um, to be to train and, and to do a little bit of training. Um, I got off a plane, I tore up a motorway to try and get to you guys on time and then suddenly found I was teaching, which, which was a bit of a strange experience, <laughs> but one I loved. Um, so uh, Richard, you, you're a seventh Dan Sheehan, author of books, a founder of the Strozzi Institute. Which of those gives you the most delight? I have never thought of it that way, but let me let me have a moment and kind of chew on that. And really what comes up is that when um, essentially they're woven into the same fabric, which is we're doing practices of awareness, we're doing practices of body orientation, we're doing practices with partners, and we're doing all of these things to go, how can we have less violence and more generosity in the world. So they really feel like really one piece to me. I think that's very true actually, They're just a different expression of the same story really. Um, so I know that you started Aikido in, was it 74? 72. 72, okay. So what were you doing before that? Had you just come out of the forces at that point? Um, no, I was um, uh, pretty much like in 69, had come out and I was had been overseas, been deployed overseas. And um, I had studied a number of martial arts before, but then we started the uh, Lomi School, uh, which was the first kind of segment of Strozzi Institute in how do we introduce working on, with and through the body to people in the helping professions. And um, uh, the roaring 60s and the 70s, an incredible time. And we decided to then do training. So we would train people to do that. We moved to um, Kauai, the northernmost island of Hawaii. And um, I was starting to do some of the Chinese arts there. And a friend said, you ought to um, do Aikido. He showed me the picture that picture of Master Washiba where he's walking down a country, small a dirt country lane, and he's holding a boken with his um, hakama on. And um, I was mesmerized. I was just mesmerized by that photo. I had begun a very serious meditation practice in India in 1969. And what had happened to me is that when I saw this person in India, I thought, oh, this is like the first human being I've ever met. Huh. And I was in kind of a, I was in a time of struggle around what was happening with the war, the culture, um, how do I find my way as a young man? And I thought this is a good model to follow. When I saw that picture of uh, Master Osensei, Master Ushiba Osensei, it was the same feeling. It was like, how do, I, I don't know what they're doing, but I wanna be that. And um, that's, that was what, what drew me to it. And um, so I sussed out a, uh, um, a dojo that was closer where we were living on the North shore. And um, they said it was full, <laughs> which I'd never heard before or since. And I think it was because they went, oh no, this is a, um, my, this is my speculation. It was an all Japanese, all Hawaiian dojo, mostly Japanese. And they heard the name and went, I don't know if we have room for this guy. I went over to a place called Hana Pepe and be, saw it and it just magnified my mesmerization of it. I had done judo, a lot of judo, a lot of jujitsu before that, some Chinese arts. I looked at this and I went, oh my God, they're not competing with each other. They're really listening to a different resonance or a different caliber of something. Mm. And I say that not like I had an attuned perception because it was the first time I had seen that art and I was still maturing in myself, but it just really rang that. If I look back, I said, what was that? And that, that's what it was. 
Um, they're not they're not competing with each other, but there's rigor in it. Mm. There's rigor in it, and they're really trying to lift everybody to the same level, and they're listening to something different besides a uh, zero sum total. You know, winners. So if I'm paying attention, you were doing body work before you found Aikido. Yep. Okay, so did you see, uh, I mean, was that also, did it make it re resonate particularly strongly because of that interest and your awareness in that, that field? Um, I think so. I think so. Uh, there was, well, to, to go back, you know, I started judo when I was about 13, did that for a long time. I earned an uh, athletic scholarship to college, um, ran internationally, ran on, I was an All-American in America. That means I was the best of college players and um, ran for the American team. And um, so in many ways, I come from the tradition of the bodily arts. Mm. So I, it wasn't unfamiliar to me in a way, but it was also um, singular, singular in what it proposed for me. Yeah, and doing body work, and I'll just say in body work, I've had just exemplary teachers in body work and, and people I've trained with, you know, I was in, in the initial training around Rolfing or structural integration. I apprenticed with a guy named Dr. Randolph Stone. Yeah. Um, I, I sat in on Moshe Feldenkrais's first training in the US and his private clients. I wasn't a formal student, but that, and, and Reiki and work. I think that the, the, the fact that there was a preponderance of people like that around the California area has given California and Aikido a particular flavor, at least the one I've tasted. Um, is, does that ring true? Yeah, it does ring true. And it um, um, uh, just that sense of breaking away from that 50s part of America, which was very flat, very uniform, nothing really exciting happening. And um, that, of course, the psychedelics and, and then some really stellar teachers in the Bay Area, you know, Robert Nadeau, then Frank Duran Sensei. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that when you went to this first dojo, it, it actually did have um, a leaning towards the philosophical side of Aikido. Um, or not? No, it didn't. The one in the one in Hawaii didn't. It was it was really pretty straight waza, and it was right at the time that Tohei was breaking away. Right. And um, I got a chance to see him, which was very impressive. But um, no, it was pretty straight waza, you know. And after class, when I became integrated into the community, and having the the tea or the beer, uh, it would get a little more philosophical. But um, it was pretty straight waza. Right, but you saw something in it beyond that, because you've talked already about uh, how people were trying to lift each other up rather than kind of beat each other down. Exactly, exactly. So I think that just that notion, the, the, Aiki, the Aiki sensibility had permeated the dojo sufficiently that it really allowed um, this notion of we're not here to win or lose, we're here to refine ourselves, refine our technique, and um, you know, like that. Okay, so how long did you spend in Hawaii before you went back to California? I was in Hawaii for a year and a half. Uh, came back to California, came back to San Francisco, um, looked up the dojo. Actually, I had written a letter to Aikido of San Francisco. Bob Nado Sensei said, you're welcome to come. Um, much more informal in the Bay Area than Japan or there. And then I came and I think that at Aikido of San Francisco, I was like the 30th person that had enrolled. So a really ground level, ground level. And um, just had the opportunity to train five days a week with a lot of peers and colleagues. And we just, it was just, it was rigorous, it was fun. And it was full of um, after class conversations about what do we mean by energy? What do we mean by Aiki? So is there anyone between numbers two and 29 that's still practicing? I'll tell you an experiment once George Leonard, 
did this at, at TAM Dojo. George Leonard, Wendy Palmer and I started TAM Applies Dojo in Marin County. And he did a very informal poll that turned out this way. If you had a hundred people that came to the dojo on January 1st, and then at the um, uh, December 31st of that year, there would be one left. I don't think much has changed. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and people love it. They get informed by it, but they don't choose it as a path. Um, but I would say in that group, when I look at it, I know that there are at least, there's, there's three others that I'm in touch with that are still engaged in Aikido. That's yeah. pretty impressive. Uh -huh. So when did you, the journey cease to be just about being a student and then you began to start teaching the stuff? Um, it was actually, um, I, I, I had no ambitions really to be a teacher. I was enthralled by the art, how it is influencing my professional work with people, um, how I was developing, what it showed me about my blindnesses. And um, uh, some people who were coming over from Marin asked Wendy Palmer to maybe teach a one day a week or something, I forget, over there. Uh, we asked Robert Nadeau Sensei if he wanted to be a part of it. He said, not now. So, you know, uh, we didn't map out a piece of green on the park. And that was, that was like 74, 75, we were brown belts. And, um, uh, and then from there, we said, God, people are saying, why don't you open a dojo? There's a lot of people want to do it. You know, this was a time, Quentin, when I started there in San Francisco, that EQs and EQs, they were like gods. They were just like gods, like, oh my God, look what they can do and how long they've been in. And, um, uh, you know, I see Paul's here. Paul was part of that group. Um, but, uh, you know, we were just like, I think, second degree brown belts or something, but we said, okay. We said, what do you think, Bob? Can you sign off on this? Frank Dransons, will you sign off? They said, sure. And sometimes we'll come over. So we said, okay. That went down the line. We started working at Anna Halpern's studio. She's a very well-known dance um, goddess and guru. She's a hundred now, a good wow. friend of mine. She, uh, we worked on her deck and right behind us, it was Mount Tamalpaya. So there was the picture of Osen saying we bowed into the mountain and O Sensei, and then rented a big space, and Mount Tamalpais Dojo is still going too. Indeed, I was lucky enough to go there too. Um, yeah, so, sort of special places to practice seems to be a thing with you. I've been very in with the art. I mean, this idea of sort of you know nature and Aikido together. Yeah, I've been very fortunate to really have. Um, I mean, even when I found this place here, where you saw. Um, you know, I, I just said, I want this to be a, a place of healing, contemplative, and martial arts. I didn't have the down payment. I thought, uh, who will come up here? It was way in the country then. But I've been blessed with really good fortune and privilege to, to have beautiful places, beautiful dojo sites. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So actually, I'm kind of intrigued how, how being in a place like that, in those beautiful rolling hills, has it provided inspiration for you? I mean, it's easy to be peaceful in a place like that, but has it actually provided with it, you with inspiration? Yeah, you know, the um, I'll, I'll say this, that I had a grandmother, a uh, maternal grandmother, who really introduced me to um, what I'll call spirit. She was an immigrant, but she did, um, you know, she read tea leaves, she did tarot decks, she did seances, and she would, she spoke about spirit and she would speak about it in terms of the landscape um, and showed me those things. So, so it was always part of me in some way. And um, so when I moved up here, it was just like a dream, dream come true. And the answer to what you're saying is that it's provided endless inspiration to me, landscape, nature, in, endless inspiration. And, you know, we have a full set of gardens here. We help feed other people. 
we have these animals, you know, so absolutely. What I've been doing now, I'll just say is that um, we've moved it, uh, the dojo outside. We wear a mask, we mostly do weapons, we have space, but the joy of going through triple digit heat, our famous fires and smoke, the pandemic, rain, cold weather. And um, when we can open the dojo, I think it's gonna be hard to get people back into the dojo. <laughs> you know, the, the coyotes visit us, the foxes visit us, the bird song visit us. We see the sunsets, the full moons, a lot of inspiration. Wonderful. I'm grateful, yeah. So has it been a difficult year? It doesn't sound like it's been a difficult year. It sounds like it's been a really inspirational year. It, it has been an inspirational year and um, I can, um, I really bow into that. Um, I can step outside here and have a really long walk and breathe good air. And I know so many people don't have that access. Um, I feel really happy that I have a partner that I can hug, <laughs> a body I can hug. And I know many people don't have that. So I don't want to say, I don't want to really appear flippant like it's been a good year. Um, but um, it has, there's some interesting way, Quentin, I don't know if it's the same for you, that it feels like the world has get, gotten smaller, but something else has gotten bigger. Hmm. So and, you know, um, for me, I mean, I will go back changed when I go back to the mat. Hmm. It's, it's been, um, quite a discovery that doing these sessions and the like has provided quite such a rich, fertile ground for sort of developing thought and, and uh, going back with new ideas that I know that will be of great benefit when I go on the mat. It, 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 it totally unexpected, but rather mm -hmm. wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. What's kind the thing of... that you will take back? To the, what's the thing that you will take back that will make the most difference for you? Um. Well, I'll say this is that um, for me, O Sensei's declaration that Aikido is a spiritual art as well as a martial art. And I know a lot of founders in their later years have really come out spiritually. We'll call it, we'll call it spiritually. But for this man in the 20th century to say this, this practice this discourse is that I think is one of the most um, powerful, powerful declarations that was made in the 20, in the 20th century. And I, I just so bow into, yes, it is a, it is a strong self-defense art if we study that. And it's a spiritual art. And in many ways, I don't think Osensei left a, a, a large canon, keep training, purify yourself, um, make a better world. But the distinctions inside of that, there's not a whole lot. So what I'm bringing back is being outside and doing that is really much more looking at what, what does it mean? What does Aiki mean? And what does it mean both, as he would say, in the manifest, the hidden, and the sacred? Now, I've always thought that, but I think I'm coming out of the closet more. And um, uh, I, uh, and the, the group of people that we, I train with here and teach are very much in those conversations too. So I think it will be really, let's dig deeper into that. Mm. So Osensi expressed the spirituality through his, his culture and his religion. How do you marry that with your background and your interpretation of what spiritual means? Well, first, I want to tell you that um, even when I, where I've studied in India as a teacher, I had a sense pretty early on that, boy, there's a lot of culture going on here that I'm missing. It's not embodied in me. I'm just missing. How can I take the culture away, like how you dress, what you say? and get to the essence of it. Um, but when um, the d current Doshu was here two years ago, I had a meeting with him and I asked him, 
that how important are the, the artifacts and the apertures and the, the, the symbolism of the Japanese culture for Aikido. And he said, as long as you're doing the principles, they're not important. So that was, I thought that was extraordinary for him to say. Oh. It felt like a big out breath. Um, and, uh, and in my study of Master Washiba over time, I saw that all the changes that he went through to being a really strict nationalist, like what's going on now to going, this is for everybody. So really tracking as I age and um, change and are transformed by the art, staying current with unpacking what's not necessary mm. and filling up what is now current and historically significant. Did that give you a kind of permission to, to teach it slightly differently or did it make no difference that that, that, that conversation with Yoshi? It, it, it did make a difference, but um, already I could see, so uh, Robert Nadeau Sensei already had a different angle on it. He already had a different angle on it, which made perfect sense to me in terms of my work with people, my doing body work, my going into embodied leadership. So all right from the beginning, I was kind of at an angle with it. You know, I had gone through um, competing in the martial arts. Uh, I'll tell you, my uh, I bow into my judo sensei, sensei Harada. And once I was as a young man in a competition and he was someplace else, he goes, how did you do? And I held up my medal. I got a gold or silver or bronze, whatever. And I says, oh, I won this. And um, he looked at me really steadily and he said, what did you win? And, and I held it up again. I said, I won this. <laughs> and he goes, what did you win? So that wisdom was already seeping, seeping through me. Right. And I think really the, um, it, it calls for us, calls for me, calls for our dojos to go, this notion of a warrior that can take effective action to assist and defend those that can't defend themselves, mm. which could be spiritual enough. But underneath that, there's this deep welling of, of we are all interdependent, we're connected. Mm. There's a ground of being that I, I, I basically long for that when I read about with Sensei's awakenings that he touched that. I think it's one of the most the things that I love most about Aikido that it is a self-development art, but you have to do the self-development with the help of others, really. So there's this give, give and get process going on constantly. And the more you give, the more you get, the more you get, the more you give. And it seems to me that that's a process that you follow through pretty well on. I, yeah, that that I, that piece that piece I think is you know really well said, Quentin, in the sense that uh, being with a part it's just it's just immeasurable. I mean, the feedback is so instantaneous, just instantaneous, and sometimes it's embarrassing what you <laughs> what you see, and other times you go, "Wow, that was great," but it actually wasn't me. It was kind of I always say it's not one and one equals two; it actually equals three. Yeah. Absolutely. So I, I always thought that the Strozzi Institute started after you, you know, when you'd been in Aikido for some time, but I'm beginning to wonder if that was actually the case. Strozzi Institute by name began after Aikido, but the predecessor Lomi School began before Aikido. Right. And um, I, all the principles that we learn, I went, these are principles for good living, leadership, parenting, et cetera, et cetera. So that was always really the, the mission for Strode Institute that you wanted to take this out into the world. What was the specific sector? Because this was going to be your living, I assume. I assume this was going to be the source of income. Lovely that you could sort of follow your passion through and it could be your source of income. So what, who were you targeting as your client market at that stage? And was it just you or were you going into this with others? No, I, we, there was a team. I went in with others. Um, at Lomi School especially, uh, I started um, uh, Strozzi Institute with the help of many people. 
Um, and um, my answer here will, will reveal my, my lack of business acumen, which I know you have. So you said, who is my market? My market was, if you have a body, you're my market. <laughs> <laughs> It's not a bad place to start. Yeah, and it's a that's a pretty big market. Yeah, it is. It is. And and then you know I uh, did this program in 85, 84, 85 with the Army Green Berets, their special forces, and our team had twenty five Green Berets under operational command for seven months. I think you should explain how on earth you got that gig. Uh huh. Um, there was a, another group that, that I was a business that I was part owner in called Sports Mind, where we did different things, did something for the um, armored division. That was great. And then a uh, officer in the special forces came to us and said, we're trying to build a, a holistic special forces soldier. So of course, many people say that's an oxymoron in the military, but a holistic soldier. I think a lot of it was a repair from Vietnam. But basically he came, he said, this is what we're looking for. This is what we'll have to do it. We said, okay, we can do that. Now we got busy going, what do we, whoops, what, how do we do that? Put together a program. And the promise of it was um, uh, uh, enhanced mental skills, physical skills and team cohesion. So we were with them from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m., six and a half days a week. And uh, part of that was we did Aikido every day. We did meditation every day. We did a meditation retreat. We did a, a Aikido Gashku. We redesigned their diet, redesigned their training regimen, their, their communication skills. And, um, their responses were just off the chart, what they could do, self-healing, self-generating, self-educating. And it was very, very difficult. Um, they have very strong bullshit detectors. And I was challenged many times on the Aikido mat, does it really work? Um, but what happened that really got me, Quentin, is that afterwards they would go back to where their posts were and everybody said, oh my God, you're much better leaders. So I think all of us on this call would go, that makes perfect sense, but we didn't promise that. We promised mental enhancements, physical enhancement and team cohesion. How long did the course last for? It was almost seven months. All right, okay. That's quite a lot. Yeah, we, we, we lived and we did, we did their, their things too. We did all of their drills and practices and jumping out of speeding boats and having spending a tax dollar tax month taxpayer dollar having a great time with them still in touch with a lot of them a lot of them went to aikido um, a lot of them um, went into meditation practices but my point here was then i went oh i should take my work talking about a market and if i go towards leaders will that be able to precipitate into their teams their communities their their organizations so that was really the place where i went here in doing that and um in the beginning when i'd say my background in aikido and this is influenced by aikido and some other martial arts things but there i could see the first image they had was bruce lee and i was like whoops we don't i said we don't want to go there so i would just talk about these principles coming from this historical wealth of Asian arts, primarily Japanese. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. So I guess it took off after that. I and mean, that's, that's not a bad major first client to get. Exactly, exactly. And um, both, the, I think the exoticism and also the respect that some, many organizations and leaders in America have for the special operations community and how they run their their business um, was attractive. So that really opened up a lot of areas in working with all the way from NGOs, nonprofits, um, to um, 
Fortune 100 companies, you know, all over five continents, you know. And then, and then there was a place I was invited by the next secretary of the Navy to give a presentation to the Marine Corps in, um, at the end of 19, the 90s. And it was, who is the Marine of the 21st century? So I uh, helped develop that. We had philosophers, we had poets, we had arms experts, we had politicians, we had geopolitical geo, um, experts. And I gave a brief debrief on the Trojan Warrior Project. I was with the Special Army Forces. And um, a man, they were really had a lot of questions, but a man by the name of Jim Jones, who was a Brigadier General elect came to me, said, I'm very interested. The next time I get a command post, I wanna to talk to you. He came back to me, not more than two, three years later, and he was the Commandant in the Marine Corps. And he said, I want you to build a program for the Marines that we call the Marine Corps Martial Art Program, which was really a genius on his part. I asked him why. And he said, when he was in Vietnam, he had one gunny sergeant that would teach martial arts in the Viet Cong, always, and they'd have practices in the morning. Viet Cong stayed away from them. And there was less alcoholism, less domestic abuse, less drug abuse. And he goes, I know it works. So um, we, um, I started the Marine Corps Martial Art Program, which is still going which is still going, it's tw his 21st year. Yeah. And um, a funny story is about that. I'm on a plane, I'm coming down, there's next to me these, these young kids. We start a conversation and uh, two of them are going into the boot camp for the Marine Corps in San Diego. The other one was going into the Navy boot camp, our Navy training. I said, well, why the Marine Corps? And they said, oh man, this, this martial art program is incredible. And that's why I'm, I just really want a piece of that. So I, I, <laughs> I said to them, <clears throat> I was one of the people that helped develop that for your commandant, Jim Jones. And they looked at me like, you old fart. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> no, they, they, they were being polite, but they were going, oh yeah, right. <laughs> well, the thing that springs to mind to, to me now is that I keep hearing people use this phrase that, you know, in order to show mercy, you have to have that capacity to be able to destroy as well. And do you think that's kind of what's going on in a, in an, you know, this is perhaps the benefit that you're equipping the Marine Corps with extra skills to be, have more choice? Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and choice all in their life, for example, the night before the next morning, we gave them a paper on, let's say, different subjects, let's say accountability, read the paper. Next morning, we do centering practices, sit down with a group of six, tell them what you learn. And if you're a Muslim, what does accountability mean for a Muslim? What does it mean for a Christian? What does it mean for a Jew? What does it mean for whatever? They do all that. Came back together again and um, we asked for questions, did questions and answers. Then everything we did during the day from the Aikido to them going into a building, to them choosing what they're eating, to going home to their families was gonna be framed around accountability. So that kind of went deeply in their body. So they learned, they learned uh, I, uh, I key principles in a lot of, we brought other arts, arts in for them that were appropriate, but it really was very holistic that way. Yeah, program I'm really proud of. And I'm um, well, not surprised. Yeah, you know, do you remember that story that I had in the anthology that you were, yeah. Yeah, I do. He, that, he, he was a guy that was involved in that. Do you yeah. want to briefly tell that story? Because there will yeah, be people who don't tell. know it. No, thanks. This was a fellow that um, he was a, uh, a lieutenant in a different uh, platoon, but he would, got involved with us, had a lot of conversation with me, really, really curious about Aikido. He's still doing it. 
um, and trained with us. I would train with him afterwards. I said, here's the best place to train for you in the San Diego area. So he was a part of it. And one of the things that happened to him is that he's in, uh, it was in Baghdad and um, there he, his platoon was doing their walking down the street. There was a funeral coming and it was unclear where the person that was dead was killed by American or allied forces or by any of the small militias, but they saw the soldiers and everybody got riled up. And um, he said to, if he, I, I heard this through the news. And he, what he did is he said, I want all of you Marines take a knee and take your helmet off and let them pass. He's, everything settled then because they listened, oh, they're showing us respect, even though they're armed and they're the, um, uh, the, the oppressors at this moment that have come into our country, but they showed us respect and everything calmed, calmed down and there was no problems. And in fact, in his area of operations, from that point on, all of the tensions and conflict went down. Mm -hmm. I asked him later, uh, I got a hold of him, I said, was that you? And he said, yeah, that was me. And I said, why did you do that? And he said, um, it was the Ike thing to do. So. Yeah, very yeah. profound. Very profound. Was, was it, was it, wasn't an Ikkyo or a Shomenuchi Ikkyo. Yeah, it was, the, it was the Ike thing to do. It's, um, as you, you probably realize, I, Aikido in daily life is kind of my message and uh, what a perfect example of uh, taking it off the mat and into real life in in the heat of the moment and getting the most wonderful result mm. yep doing doing it right in the kitchen heat of the moment yeah so i'm kind of so you you've worked in a lot of big corporations too and i'm wondering if the mil working in the military was maybe in some ways easier because you've got that discipline and structure and you are going to do this course. So they kind of had no choice. Um, and in a way it was, it was the cooking pot, the firing thing that made you have a wonderful thing to take out to everybody else or whether actually it made the corporate environment because it's not quite as disciplined was harder to work in. Interesting question. One of the things that I saw is that in my work with the military, um, their, um, the consequences of their, of their actions might be at the end of the block or the end of the jungle trail. Mm. In corporate America, it had to do with fourth quarter, three quarters away. So the horizons of time are very, very different. Very, very different. So um, that was something to really like, if you said to somebody in the, the special operations community, I'm walking down this jungle trail and do you have my back? And if they said, I'll do my best, they'll go, that's not enough. <laughs> do you have my back? Yes or no? And so that kind of rigor I, I, part of me attempted to bring it into the corporate uh, community. So let's say we don't have four quarters of breathing room. I understand the, having large horizons of time, but right here, right now, who do you want to show up as? And how does that presence begin to shift your company or your team or whatsoever? So it, it was in many ways, um, and I also would say whoever was the central customer, Quentin, who signed the check, I'd say, before we start, you should know this. By the time people will finish this, a number of them will say, um, I'm in the wrong place. I, I, I don't belong here. I'm, I, my passion's not here. So people will go through this transform and going, oh, my love is and where I want to put my energy. I said, that's good for you too, because you won't have any half-hearted players. So um, that occurred also. So it was both, it was both in many ways easier after uh, special operations, that big, big project 
and also it was also more difficult. Mm -hmm. So how did you, I mean, I, I kind of think you, you created a little bit of a wildfire here and, and once it got going, how did you keep up with the demand? How did you build the team around you that could provide the level of expertise that you, you yourself were given? It became clear to me that um, not, not unlike the dojo model, that it was important to have um, other whatever I knew and whatever I could do, how do I get that into other bodies so they could teach it? So then began to develop a teacher training program. So they would have to go through so many courses, get that in their body, then we'd come together as a teaching body and be with me, have conversations with me. Then there would be senior people that would begin to teach. And um, very, very much like, like the dojo model in that way. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, and, and, you know, way back then, you know, if, if you said body or you said, okay, we did this, now let's all stand up. They go, well, I sit all day and I, I'm just typing or I'm on the phone. There was no texting then. What's my body? So it have to build in them the, the interpretation of, mm. it's, not the, it's not the body, it's not the sports body. It's not the body as object or it's a tool for you it's your whole beingness yeah so but to answer your question it was really the notion of uh, training a teacher body my, my first my first image really Quentin was the notion that everybody should be a black belt in Aikido and then I saw from where people came in at different stages that was unlikely although many of them are, are gone rank in Aikido or started some other art, which is, I think is a big advantage. Yeah. So I've often, I've often felt that, um, yes, we go through this ranking system in Aikido, but some people arrive on your mat and they're natural black belts in terms of where they are in their lives. And other people, they're, they're starting right at the beginning when they arrive. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I guess that's what you're acknowledging that, you know, sometimes you meet people who are there, they're kind of there anyway. And Aikido just in, enhances that when they arrive. Yeah, that's right. So, so we're living in an age where, you know, we're fighting this tide of keeping, you know, people are on phones, they're in front of, you know, of computers, they're working on tablets. I mean, crikey, this year more than ever, um, and I think it's a bit of an issue that, you know, the kids of today don't go out and play soccer or, or you know, whatever sport, baseball in your case, cricket and rugby here. Um, are we fighting a tide that we can't beat? Something I think about a lot, you know, probably like yourself, um, when I was a kid, I would go, if I went by a, a, a playground, kids are playing basketball, there would be a list of who gets to play. I mean, it was, it was packed and people are out doing stuff. Baseball, that I can go up, volleyball, um, football. I go past those playgrounds a day. There's hardly anybody there. I mean, pre-COVID, yeah. right? There's, there's hardly anybody there. And um, uh, it does, it, I think that it creates definitely a question about Aikido, but it, it questions about what kind of human being are we becoming and what are we losing out of that in a way? And um, uh, e even just a small percentage of states in America of the 50 require anybody does any physical education. And um, from my point of view, and I think from many Ike people point of view, we learn through our bodies. Huh? Sure. We do these reps, we get the, and, and um, comes forth. So I think it's a, it's a, I think it'll be a big cost. And um, I'm, I'm in pretty um, uh, steady conversations with thinkers that I appreciate about what does it mean to um, uh, really reinvigorate that. And of course, one is you have a good kids teacher. And then when soccer season comes, you don't lose everybody to soccer or how do those two go together? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the sessions I'd quite like to run is a, I'd like to find a, a good session on Aikido and the link to the environment. 
because mm. uh, it kind of feels that you know we know we're out of balance with the the, the the nature system if you like and we know we have to get back there uh, and you're living in this wonderful place uh, any thoughts or and does it influence you uh, your your approach to the environment let me tell you i it, it, this might answer your question um we, we begin the class either explicitly or implicitly um, um, saying who's, who are the original people on this land. Sometimes I'll say it explicitly, sometimes I'll just say it to myself, but it's a reminder that, oh, this was, this was the, name, the original people here with the coastal Miwoks. And in fact, on this land, they used to walk over to the two rocks to do their fairs. And then we'll always we'll bow in and then we'll stop and just presence ourselves to the bird song, to the changing temperature, feeling the ground, the uneven ground beneath us, the smells, where's the wind coming from? We look at the sky above. And um, so there's that piece. We, we always have a moment where we extend down, palms down. Um, and we, we express gratefulness to the earth and we express gratefulness to the heavens and then to people. And partway during the class, um, uh, in, we, we, we've taken it down where we would have a canopy in case the sun was too hot or if it rained, we've taken that down and halfway through the class where we might go from no weapons to weapons, we'll all walk out into the night. And I say, let's just stand here for um, five minutes and see how Sat Jupiter's been trailing Saturn, what phases the moon, listen to the night, night birds, the owls. So really try to bring that in. And like I say, I think there's a number of students will, when we say, let's go back in the dojo, they go, let's keep at least one class outside. Mm -hmm. Even the younger ones, when, and the younger ones now are in their 40s, right? But they're, they're sometimes they'll roll. They'll take rolls on the dirt. Do you think they, they fully appreciate why you're doing that? I think so. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and do you see that spreading elsewhere in other, in other clubs and dojos? Is that a big message that we should be getting out there? This, you know, you need to tune into nature. You need to be in balance with it, and, and all the ramifications of that when you're going through your daily life and what you're doing with your rubbish and what you buy and everything. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the in the courses that I'm doing online, not Aikido, I'll always start with a shout out like, um, "We have a, a planet that's in trouble." We have a planet that's in trouble. Um, we have um, uh, murders of people of color. Our political institutions are breaking. Um, there's not only a global pandemic, there's a global anxiety that's happening. So what we're doing now is we're doing some medicine for those things so we don't do violence to ourselves, or to the planet or other people. Sure. So I, I don't, I don't know if any others are doing that. I know the people that, you know, I have a number of dojos in Ethiopia. Uh, we do that for sure. And the other dojos under me have that sensibility also. Yeah. yeah. Do you, do you do something there? Do you do something there? Um, no, I don't think I do it as much as I should. So I think that's something I, I'll take away from this conversation and ponder on and see how I want to bring that into my practice. Yeah, um, I don't quite have the view you have, but I do work in a lovely stone barn that opens out onto a lovely garden. And, you know, those doors are open in the summer, as are the windows. And I think that does affect the nature of the practice. You know, it's part of kind of the, the image I want to portray and, and, and be aligned with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe so. Do you want to talk a bit about, a bit about Ethiopia? Ethiopia, oh, yeah. To you. Yes, indeed. Um, so with, with um, uh, we, we began the program training across um, borders. 
with um, Professor Levine, who's, who's a beginner here. Um, and uh, I, uh, I'll say, I remember that I was walking with um, Philip Eminger at a Satomi Sensei ASU retreat in Colorado. And um, Don was talking about his vision about AE. And it was really that moment. So anyway, I just think fondly of him right now and what is that? And then he and I put together this program called Training to Cross Borders that happened in 2005 in Nicosia, where we had a number of people, all from the uh, uh, Mediterranean basis, basin that had been at conflict with each other forever and trained together. It might be worth explaining the significance of Nicosia at that time and, and now probably as a, as a base to put the course. Yeah, well, you know, we, there's always the, 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 the conflict in um, the Palestinians and Israelis is the cornerstone of the Middle East. And uh, from my point of view is that if that starts to get settled in some way, it, it has the possibility of calming other things down, but that's key. Um, this was during uh, the Iraq war. So the Americans in Iraqi are in Iraq. Um, Bosnians and Serbs, Turks and Greeks. Um, and so we had all of those players that were there. And Don, whose uh, major in the sociology was around Ethiopia, met a young man testify to Kulu, and we got tests to come over. And um, he trained, we had a very, very good connection, Tess and I. And then we went back and I invited him to come to be Uchi Deshi here at the ranch. So he came and became Uchi Deshi, got his shodan, went back and um, started teaching Aikido. I said, yeah, go ahead and start teaching Aikido. Um, did that for a while, came back again, got his lived, got his knee done, trained intensively, went back again, condensing the story. It kept growing and growing and growing. So now we have, um, I've been over there twice um, uh, and we have 11 dojos in Ethiopia, wow. one in Kenya, and um, uh, yeah, Madagascar, that, that's really Kenya, but it felt, feels like a different country. So Tess is really running that, um, and uh, it, we do it through his organization called the it, um, uh, the Institute for Social Advancement. So that Aikido is the foundation and it's all the principles, but the kids who come in also do um, art, they do music, they do um, uh, gymnastic things. And what we found out is that, and we make them when they come, they have to do their homework first and they have to keep their grades up. So since we've been doing it, there's more high school graduates, there's more college graduates, there's more them going into college, which is positive there. There's zero now unwanted pregnancies. And we've also went into looking at um, clitorectomies uh, for the young women, which have been greatly reduced too. We do, um, uh, I have connections with the um, American embassy there. We've done, um, uh, uh, you know, demonstrations there for them. They do a program for Ethiopian women. We said, oh, we should, we have some Ethiopian women that can show these Aiki principles. So, um, and we do it so it doesn't become the, um, uh, the, 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 the white person savior doing it. It's really Tess and the Ethiopians that are doing it. We lend support. My ranking lends support. I teach them. I help Tess Grove, and something I'm very proud of, and uh, very proud of Tess. Tess is also on the uh, training program for um, SI too. Astrosi Institute. Astrosi Institute. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So he he um, he teaches in some of the programs. Amazing. So it's wonderful to be involved in something that's making such a difference. Do you? Do you feel that you're able to sort of make that same sort of difference locally? Can you see big change locally through the work 
that you and actually those other great teachers that are in your locality. Locally, do you mean the Bay Area? Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Your, um, your fair share, really. It's not fair. I, I, I think that I think that the in, inside of the embodiment community, the somatic community, that I think SI is really kind of seen as the the mecca, you know, where we're really keeping quality and originating a lot of things um, uh, towards the, the, this other stuff. And um, the Bay Area, in, in my hesitation here, Quentin, is there's so much in the Bay Area that I will say that th there's a lot of people being jaded too. Okay. Oh, right, I know that, or I did, I did that weekend and I've done that, or I've done that. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and while I don't wanna say that, um, like I'm prejudiced against it in any way, but that's, that's there. There's a, there's, it's a big menu and mm -hmm. a lot of it is very, very good and very, very rich. And um, it's a big menu. So have I influenced it that way? Um, yeah, I think in the feedback, I, Strozzi Institute, we've definitely influenced it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we've, got, we've reached an, an interesting time in American, in America, really. You know, from the outside, it looks pretty split. The politics looks difficult. Environmental issues, racist issues, racism issues. Is that something that you would like to play a part in 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 the healing or do you feel you're already doing that yes yes it is and um um i've done quite a bit of work with people who are in social justice and environmental justice work in built in taking this work and going in leadership uh, it, this is how it can inform your leadership Leadership has, as you know, a lot of different categories here, but this notion of how you are showing up, we always say three things. You have to be committed enough. You have to have some kind of competency in your domain. And then there's who you are, who you are. We work with who you are. And um, so I feel um, it, it's very satisfying to work with people who are activist, and on the ground and see the value of this work, both as working with their own trauma, resilience, resourcefulness, but also building skills, skills of pres presence. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we've been going for about an hour and I reckon that's about the fastest hour I've, I've ever done on, on these sessions. It, it's been a rich conversation. So at this point, I'd like to open up the mic to others and see if they've got questions for you. But before I do that, have you got a question that you want to pose to them? Or a, a final thought? Just a final thought. There's Tess right there. Hi, Tess. So what is your final thought you want to offer? Um, no, let, let me offer at the end. Okay, but, that's fine. But, that's good. Okay, so uh, gang, um, I'll now go on to gallery view so I can see a bit more, but uh, anyone got a question or point you'd like to make? Uh, Rob? Let me, do you want to open up your mic? Sensei, thank you uh, for the conversation. Um, I remember long before I met you, reading about you and specifically reading about your Shodan test, uh, which I believe it was George Leonard describing as in all sorts of quasi mystical terms as, you know, sort of a, a, uh, an extraordinary thing. I'm curious for what you remember from being the guy doing it. <laughs> All these years later. Yeah, these years later. Uh, it's interesting you ask, Rob, because um, I just finished a book and my working title is Embodying the Mystery, Notes from a Somatic Pilgrim. And I talk about that test and I talk about it, it being one of the portals 
that had me go, oh, what what is this other universe that's parallel to this one that has ease in it and it has uh, luminosity in it and it has potential in it. And um, uh, what I remember about it was that there was something that overtook me or I was captured by something. Perhaps another way I could say is that I had let go, you know, I had gone um, through kind of a trial and tribulation. I won't go into it now, those six months ahead of time where all of my peers were going to go up and my teacher wasn't sure he was gonna put my name up. So there was some way I was getting emptied. And what I can take away is like, oh, the importance of continuing to grow and transform is to continue to be rigorous about examining how your one's identity and the self and what that is and letting that go into what's next. And um, that piece, and then the piece that I went in with like, wow, I learned five minutes before I was gonna take the test. I had no expectations, I'll just do my best. And all of the muttering in my mind, the lamenting and the planning was gone, it was empty. And just the power of that space. So I take it it went pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, has anybody else got a question they'd like to ask or a point they'd like to raise? I can't believe you're gonna, anybody, not more angry. Hi, uh, thank you, Richard. Um, I just want to say before I ask my question um, that uh, it was reading your book that made me interested in Aikido about six or seven years ago. So uh, thank you very much for that. It's been a great journey. I'm really enjoying it. Stop, start, stop, start. I'm definitely not a natural, but uh, I'm hanging in there. <laughs> so my question is, what took you to Ethiopia? Well, the uh, it, it, um, first of all, let me ask you, what book did you read? Um, the Leadership Dojo. Leadership Dojo, yeah. Um, well, it was because of doing the training across borders program, getting all these people together. And then Tesfai, who's on this call, was at that group. And as we got closer and closer and when he lived with me and then built that up, and he said, it's really time for you to come and let's do another, another big project there instead of for, for, for the African people, Ethiopians. That, that's, that's where it was. If you, if you ever go to Ethiopia, it's extraordinarily unique place and um, uh, varied and beautiful in many ways. And you would have many dojos to train in and they would really welcome you. Wonderful, right, thank you. Sounds like a plan. Can I, Quentin, it's, it's uh, Deborah, and um, I'd like to follow up and ask another question about the Ethiopia uh, dojos, if that's okay. Um, because I'm wondering, first of all, I, I knew about the project, um, but I didn't realize there were 13 dojos and that it had grown that um, tremendously in Ethiopia. But I'm really wondering, about how it's been in this last sort of couple of years um, with the sort of escalating conflict in different parts of the country and also with COVID and the restrictions that COVID has imposed. And it's one thing for, um, for us in places like the UK or California to do Zoom sessions and try to do things online and so on, but that's not the reality for a lot of other people. Um, including in places like Ethiopia. So I'd just really be interested to hear from you, uh, Richard Sensei, or from Tess, or both of you, um, some more sort of details about how, how that's working and, and the impact and, and the adaptations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. You, you follow international politics, huh? Um, yes. <laughs> I mean, I, we haven't met before, but uh, my name is Deborah. I worked for years in Israel and Palestine. Um, mm. I'm currently working uh, 
for an NGO with a focus on Syria and Lebanon, a lot of work with Syrian refugees. And uh, anyway, <laughs> and I've been doing Aikido for about 20 years as well. So, um, well, thank you. On so I'm very aware. Aware. She worked for Amnesty International. And, and mm. yeah, yeah, anyway, I'm very aware of the situation in Ethiopia. I've done, I've not been there, but I've done, um, some work on the country and and yeah so i'd just be interested to hear more yeah thank you for your good work deborah um let me say this is that um uh we're very much in touch with ethiopia um you know uh, tess now lives in the bay area he lives in oakland but through him we're very much in touch with ethiopia um the this latest conflict was was pretty major and as i understand it and, and I want to say it in that way because it's, it was very clear to me being in Ethiopia that there are things happening there that are going over my head, you know, their sense of time and how they relate. You know, it's, I, I, I don't want to position myself like I know Ethiopia, but, but um, they, they seem to have seasons of these kind of conflicts where everything will be shut down, opens up again. 18 months later, it happens again. Um, I don't want to say they've normalized it, but it's part of that living. This one would seem larger. Um, our dojos um, uh, continued. And what we know is that our dojo that we have built in Owasa is that um, where we now have a dedicated dojo, a piece of land, and we're building the dojo, um, that all the members of the different tribes can train there under that same roof, which is significant. And, and all the other things I said of the great work Tess has done about building, um, it's yes, Aikido, but also building a uh, citizenry that we can really deal with women's issues. We can deal with conflict in a different way. We can educate ourselves and so forth. Is that the other one is that, oh, in these times of conflict where there's really a lot of tribal, um, lines and divides, all these young people are training together. And, and, and that's rare. That's really rare. And it's cri critical. And I know um, Tess is in, they have a, a peace minister and Tess is very much in contact with their office about what we're doing. Also, as you probably imagine being over um, in the places you've been, the bandwidth there is much more narrow. So anytime they get a chance that I'm doing something or we're doing something online, they try to get online, but it's very, very difficult. Also, we have nobody that's had, co uh, had, the, had the virus in all the dojos. There's no reports. Everybody is still healthy. Um, this is a place in which there's not many people that are in their own cars driving. They're in packed buses. They're, they're in packed motor scooters. It's all very, very close. But so far, all these people have stayed healthy, which we really, really give thanks to. So in, uh, in terms of the entire situation, um, we're still running. We were going to do a, a big African project uh, um, last year and then this year, and we go, no, we can't do it. Sometimes during the conflicts, the domestic flights, no more domestic flights. And um, there's, there, there's quarantine in certain areas. So maybe we're looking at 22 of doing maybe another big program there. That's the short answer. It's not a bad answer. Anybody else? Hugh. You are trying to unmute, aren't you, Hugh? There we go. Sorry, third click. Lucky. Um, I just had a question going, going right back to the beginning. You spoke of the spiritual element of Aikido, and I think you used the, the phrase coming out of a, a, an older generation about their spirituality. And so my question is, um, why does it take so long? I, I've heard this before from some of the elders of the Aikido world, but why is it at the end of the path that they're prepared to come out 
spiritual element. And is there a way of encouraging that much earlier in people's Aikido careers? Um, let me tell you a story that happened for me when I was in Hawaii, is that I'm in Hawaii training. I get to know the community, so I start to join them afterwards. And there was a man there who went to Maui when Osensei came to Maui. Yeah, back in, I think that was maybe, I don't know, 59 something, I don't know. But he was there with him and saw him. And he was probably about 13 years old at that point. And he told this story where he said that, and he, left, he did Aikido after he left, left moved away from it for a while and then came back again. And the story he tells is that Osensei said to him, to their group, you will never understand Aikido if you don't know about the floating bridge of heaven. Yeah. In fact, you will, know, you will never understand any martial art if you don't know about the floating bridge of heaven. So he said, he and his other 13 year old buddy, they look at each other and they go, what the friggin' is he talking about? Right, floating bridge of heaven. What is, what? And he said, we don't know, but let's keep training. He kept training. He's in a place now where that seed had dropped in and, and flourished. For me, it really is like, I have, I have de depending upon where I'm teaching Aikido, I, I'm, I'm pretty open about this is a spiritual path and it's a strong martial art. And his declaration was so ambitious in, in, in knowing world history. Um, really what I'm talking about is when I would work in organizations. So I basically come and I'll say starting with my, my grandmother then having a meditation teacher and so forth is that um, in working with organizations, if I would say, now it's important that we pay attention to the life of our body. And people looked at me like I was crazy. What do you mean? That, you know, the, this is that we're back in the 80s, huh? Even in the 90s. What do you mean, my body? Now that's changed a lot. But I realized that, that was, if I would have gone out and saying, this is actually a spiritual path. They wouldn't have seen Bruce Lee. They would probably would have seen Maharashi, Maharishi or something that I went, that's too big of a speed bump right now. That's just too big of a speed bump. Um, and so the coming out too is this book that I will come out in the beginning of next year, Embodying the Mystery, is really speaks much about those incidents in my life that informed a certain spiritual sensibility in me. I have and, to ask uh, this question, Richard, because I, I it's 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 a it's a word spiritual and aikido. I never know quite how to define it. So, what does it mean for you? This happened in this happened in um, Hanapepe Kauai too. Remember, I've been doing other martial arts. I've competed. I taught hand to hand combat in the Marine Corps. We're going to do class. I'm ready to throw people around and bend wrist and love the love the sweating, love the camaraderie. He he has us do an unbendable arm. The professor Tohei brought up. I like I'd never heard of that unbendable arm. And he says, "Okay, get in your hara, go out now. I want you to extend out to the corners of the universe." I have this big burly guy next to me couldn't bend my arm. I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> what is that? Like I had never done it before. The instructions were totally elementary and there was something right there. Had I experienced out of the body experiences before? Yeah. Um, it, having a Kota Gaishi and breaking my arm, a spiral fracture. And I'm on the roof looking down at myself running once that happened. But in that moment I went, that's that, that, if people say, when you do that, is that your mind or your body? And I had this moment of going, that's spirit. That's what spirit is. Spirit is this core life energy that's animating me and all sentient beings. 
And the more that I can open up to that and relax into that and allow that to inform me, that is my belief, an essential part of the spiritual path. Okay, that's beautifully put. Thank you. So, so Hugh, I want to say to you is that, um, I mean, it, I, I think that if we do Aikido and we go, oh, I can be kinder to my partner, to my kids, to my employees, that's, that's part of the spiritual path too. But Osensei pointed to something, an experience that he had where he didn't feel as a separate, solid self. He felt he was connected to everything. And I think that that's that's what that's that's what I'm thirsty for. That's what Sensei calling, hang on. <laughs> Talk amongst yourselves, guys. <laughs> it's the new cummy phone. <laughs> Very good. Um, so has anybody else got a, a question or something they would like to raise? Demetra. Yes, hello. Hi, I'm in Athens, Greece. <laughs> and I want to say that I feel very deeply touched from listening to all this wonderful story and descriptions. And I feel it's very good that you described your way of comprehending and living what we call spirituality, because I think during my years of practicing, I, I have seen that many people uh, avoid to get into spirituality because they identify it with organized religion. So that prevents them from going deeper. For many people that I've met so far in martial arts or Tai Chi where I also practice that they have, there is a tendency that they identify spirituality with organized religion. So if they're against organized religion, they are against spirituality. So they keep away, they keep away. So they, um, and I think it, it was wonderful that the way you described it as a connection to life and to the universal intelligence that is above us and much bigger than us. And it has nothing to do with uh, necessarily with religion. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Dimitri. Yeah, it, it's something for me that is out, uh, uh, outside more than our personalities, our egos, our, our, our character. And when you said that difference between religion and spirituality, I always think of that, you know, religion is for people who are afraid to go to hell and spirituality are for people who've already been in hell. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Very good. <laughs> David. Hello, thank you, uh, Richard. That was a, a fantastic um, uh, talk you've given us all, um, a conversation. So um, just to, again, following the spirituality thing, which I think is a, is a, is a big thing. And um, I'm just wondering, what do you think is, is anything uniquely in Aikido that helps develop the spirituality that maybe other martial arts don't have or or is it available in in many of any of these sort of arts or ways or things of doing things or is there something unique about Aikido that helps that spiritual path? Yeah, great question. One of my questions was that, you know, uh, Osensei was, a, he, always, he had a history of being interested in the spiritual realm through Shintoism and uh, Onisaburo, uh, you know, the, th those things, and even some Buddhism, and he was always had that for himself. But um, I thought, well, if he was a, a calligrapher, what if he had a, the same kind of opening? Or if he did Ikebana flower arranging, would have been that same kind of opening. But he was a martial artist, a renowned martial artist. And, and so I, I, I think, yes, it can come out of calligraphy. It could come out of flower arranging. It could come out of judo. And there, what Aikido has done and what it appears to me is that it puts in front this notion of musubi, huh? musubi, that we tie in with our partner. So that, and if we do that enough and take that sincerely and say, actually the techniques arise from that, 
It's not, I'll do my technique and use it, Masubi. If I really feel that connection um, and how we do that, then we begin to realize that, um, as I said before, we're, we're not solid separate beings from our, the trees and the stones and the other human beings. And then there's the place of what is beautiful about Aikido. Quentin touched on it just, we have this partner in front of us and we get immediate feedback. And I know that if I'm pushing them and they go, hey, what's going on? That I'm not letting that core life energy flow freely through me. I'm actually tightening against it. Yeah, but I've met people who clearly whose who's, their paths have been sitting meditation and they're very, very awake people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great Anyone else? Vitaly? Probably make this yeah. the final question. Yeah, thank you so much. But I wanted to bring back the question about getting people back uh, to Dodgers. Because you were saying that in previous time, there were a lot of people in different playgrounds, to different courts playing, and you had to wait in queue to get to play. But in our days, there's not a lot of people. And I wanted to raise a question, say about how to bring them back. Have you ever thought about that? And what my concern is how to bring, for example, I'm struggling to get more people with disabilities in our classes over here. Mm. Uh, and it's complicated, especially in my country, to get them there and to encourage them to come. Have you ever thought what is the best possible way to bring people in? Um, Vitaly, let me let me go to your first piece. Um, and, and I'll start by saying um, one of the things that is my experience has showed me that people will usually make a move, do something different or go to something different for one of two reasons. Either there's a huge breakdown in their life and something's not working and they go, oh, I've got to do something about that. You know, like what I go is you, the person looks on the floor and you go, oh, there's blood on the floor, somebody's bleeding. And then they finally realize, oh, it's me that's bleeding. I need to fix that. The other thing is somebody sees a possibility. So they see an Aikido demonstration. They see people on the mat. They see six years old, six year old people on the mat. They see 80 year old people on the mat and they go, wow, that is a possibility for my life. So I think that's the model that I use that we go, our, what I hold is that we aren't fully serving our young people by having them be in the screen all the time, sitting down all the time. There's a whole level of their nervous system or spirit, if you will, that is becoming atrophied. And this is what, how, this is the effect that that will have on our social sphere, our political sphere, our economic sphere, our secure, security field. So they, they, we get in touch with that breakdown about it. And the other piece is that when you, when you talked about in the disability field um, that uh, if I may, I would give you a suggestion, okay? Is that go out, see, see places where they gather, uh, conferences, talks, I mean, it's all different now and not just part of COVID, but go out to them, speak about it to them. And then do you have experience of working with people with disabilities? I, uh, I got a disability, I've got an MS mm -hmm. and uh, I uh, try to work with them. It's pretty complicated to come to them in our country. Because, you know, for a long of time, for a long of time, just uh, our authorities have, were trying to forget that such people exist. Mm -hmm. That's why it's complicated. We don't have enough facilities to get to them. And we need to pull our, the people out of their partners and to encourage them to do something 
just anything. Yes. Can, I, can I offer something here, Vitaly, which is that I think you're at the start of a very long journey. But you're the pioneer here. The, the, it isn't an easy road that you're traveling, but it takes people like you to start it. And, and you're, you're making it easier for the next generation of people who face your problem. So I don't think Richard can offer you a magic bullet. I just think he can offer you moral support as we all can here to assist you to make that path just a little bit easier. Richard, please Thanks. chip in if you think I've got something else to add there. Say that again, Quentin, I missed that. I say that I don't, I think Vitaly's really sort of pioneering the journey yeah. for disabled people in Russia. He's got an incredibly difficult background to fight against and, <laughs> and there's no easy path away from it, but there has to be a pioneer and he's being it. And I, I suspect that you haven't got a magic bullet to offer other than the moral support. Yeah, no, I think that your, your suggestion um, is, is to take the long view is right. And, and you know what occurs to me, Vitaly, is that um, you, you, you have some ground to speak to it, that you, you have MS yourself and you do Aikido and, and you, you say this is what offering. So even if, you know, when I came back from Hawaii and then here, there were places that I had two or th two people in the class. And I go, okay. Inshallah, God's will, two people, let's do it. Yes. Uh, would, would, would I be able to help some way, Quentin? Uh, I'm sure you can. You and Vitaly should have, have, a, have a talk. I'll put you in touch. Um, okay. Yeah, Steve's blind. We, we, you know, so actually we've built a bit of a community here. Uh, Vitaly regularly talks to Molly. So, you know, you have built a network of people who are giving you some grand support. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm I'm very aware of the time, um, so Paul, if you wanted to chip in, if it's really quick, right. The best thing you can do. I've had Parkinson's for 18 years. If you keep on keeping on, you people will see that you can do that through Ike. Thank you, Paul. That was worth saying. Um, so, Richard, finally, I pass across to you. What would you like to offer? Um, two things, um, and this, this was something I've been reflecting on, you know, we'll ask like, what does the universe want of me now? How can I be of best use? Is that ask yourself, um, uh, what does your, it, let's call it your key. What does your energy want to nourish? What does your enter, what does your energy want to nourish in the world? are in yourself. And number two is what we say at Strozzi Institute is take it easy, but take it. Sounds good to me. Um, <laughs> um, I, I've really thoroughly enjoyed talking to you. Uh, um, yeah, it's just been great. So thank you so much for your time, Richard. Very generous of you. Um, I hope we stay in touch. I'm sure we will. Um, yeah, just thank you. You're welcome. Good to see you again. Thanks for the Thank invite. You. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Richard. All right, evening. Uh, cheers, everybody. Thank you for showing up once more. Uh, I'm sure you found it a benefit. Thanks, Thank Richard. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's always good to see you, Richard. You. Yeah. Thank you. Paul. Yes. Yes. How are you, Tess? Nice to see uh, you, Katina. Right. Hey. <laughs> Good to see you, Tiger. Tiger. <laughs> yeah. I, I hope you'd be here, Tiger. Yeah, I'm um, yeah. yeah. Good man. Good man. Thank you. All right, I'm going to close the room now, guys. So, cheerio. All right, thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah.